Welcome to a special virtual edition of the Skeptics Track at DragonCon, where we put the science in science fiction. So, welcome again to DragonCon's virtual streaming fun. We're here at the Skeptic Track again, and our next guest speaker is going to be Jonathan Tweet. Jonathan, let's uh, find a little bit about you. Uh, so, before we get to what your presentation is going to be about, um, you are actually, a, you're pretty steeped into what most people at DragonCon like to do. So, tell us a little about your background. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been a tabletop game designer since uh, 1987, and um, I was the lead game designer on uh, third edition D&D back in 2000. Lots of people have heard of me uh, because of that. Um, but I did my own games um, before that, so Ars Magica I did with Mark Reinhagen back in 87, and um, Over the Edge is a, a funky little independent role-playing game that um, I came up with in uh, 92. It had a big influence on the independent uh, game design scene. Um, Everway was sort of a, a multicultural, image-oriented role-playing game before its time in 95. I did that at Wizards, and then third edition at Wizards, a bunch of other, you know, some uh, card games and miniatures games and things like that. Um, I've done uh, some Facebook and digital games, but mostly it's been uh, tabletop stuff. 13th Age is sort of uh, a more personal take on um, Dungeons and & Dragons. And, uh, and then we re-relaunched um, Over the Edge uh, just recently for, um, you know, kind of a whole new generation of gaming with, you know, updating it from, you know, the 90s where I think it was ahead of its time, but whatever, it was still 92. And so we did a lot of updating and rewriting. And um, so that's my uh, my game design history. That's what I've done for a living. Uh, more recently, I've gotten into science communication for children and especially uh, evolution communication. Very cool. Now, before I get to the, some of the questions about that, how weird is it for you to have that last name now that Twitter's a big thing? Yeah, well, so the jokes have changed. You know, they used to be about Tweety Bird or Rock and Robin, and now they're about Twitter. So I, I guess that's an improvement. I'm not <laughs> hearing the same jokes about my name as I used to. Yeah, see? <laughs> I would figure that's better than Tweety Bird. So Yeah, that's, that's right. People say you get a nickel every time someone tweets, and I wish I got a nickel every time someone made that joke. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the presentation you're about to show us. Sure. Um, so I've always been kind of interested in how you bring big ideas to uh, kids, and um, evolution has been a big part of that. Um, and so uh, back in 2014, I went on Kickstarter to raise money for uh, Grandmother Fish. It's the first picture book to teach evolution to preschoolers and uh, that really got me to see how excited kids are about evolution and how excited uh, teachers and parents are for their kids to learn about evolution and so I started doing um, some more work in that area and also looking at what other people have done so um, I'm going to look at um, you know my game Grandmother Fish or my book Grandmother Fish a, a game that I did also on Kickstarter uh, called Clades and it's a sister game Clades Prehistoric and got a new Kickstarter on right now called Crow Scientist that helps kids observe crows. Those are the things I've done, but I also want to look at uh, some of the best books that are out there from uh, scientists and um, other resources that you can use to introduce evolution to little kids. It's such a big topic, right, that you can uh, sort of come at it from lots of different angles. Uh, do you teach descent with modification over time, or do you de teach natural selection? Those are two different but important parts of uh, of evolution, and um, and so I'll just sort of go over what I've learned um, that works in terms of uh, what books are great and what approaches are great and what kids like to hear about, so that you'll get lots of ideas about how to uh, talk to kids or play with kids or read to kids. Um, when you're talking about evolution. Very cool. See, yeah. that's why you have to come back next year. Hopefully we'll be all in person 
so we can have a bunch of kids in the room at the same time so you can I talk directly to them. That would be great. Yeah. So I, let's... I, I read, I read, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, I've read my book to lots of kids, uh, and they seem to like it. So the, uh, the book Grandmother Fish gets kids to... Um, or like wiggle like a fish and who like an ape and do these actions that uh, derive from our ancestors' actions. And kids love to act things out and they love animals and they love families and we're all part of the animal family. And so, yeah, it's a big kid pleaser. Yeah, it's always fun when I have to like remind parents, take their kids that we're all animals. So yeah. don't use that as like a derogatory term because... <laughs> You're one, too. You're just an ape, okay? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're big, emotional, social apes. Yeah. Yes, pretty much. Well, i am let you do your presentation, and we'll talk a little bit at the end. That sounds great. Thanks, Derek. Hey there, I'm Jonathan Tweet. I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, all sorts of books and games that you can use to introduce evolution and evolutionary concepts uh, to kids. I've uh, found that kids really like uh, learning about evolution and their place in the animal kingdom. Uh, now here at Dragon Con, I think some of you might know me first by my uh, games. So, you know, Ars Magica was from uh, 1987, Over the Edge was 92, kind of a, a weird uh, oddball game. I uh, started working at Wizards of the Coast, we did Everway, uh, that's a whole other story. Um, then Wizards of the Coast bought Dungeons and & Dragons, and I was the lead designer on Dungeons & Dragons 3rd uh, Edition back in 2000, so that was a plum project, you can believe that. 13th Age, uh, that was 2013, I did that with my best friend Rob Hainso, he was the lead designer on 4th Edition of D&D, so this is kind of our love letter to D&D, and our Dungeons & Dragons our way. Then in 2019, this is uh, Over the Edge uh, again. So completely redone for uh, the modern era. So that's how a lot of you uh, know me, but maybe what fewer of you know is that uh, I'm a big lover of teaching kids about evolution. So most of the time I was working at Wizards uh, on my own, in my free time, I was working on this book, Grandmother Fish. Uh, I was inspired by my daughter when she was really little and it took me 15 years uh, to get the book right. Um, and then when I did, I took it on to uh, Kickstarter, we raised money, we self-published, we sold out, and then uh, Macmillan bought it. And so now it's in, uh, it's in bookstores everywhere. It's in Italian, Chinese, Japanese. So um, this is a big part of how I introduce uh, evolution uh, to kids. Uh, here's a kid-friendly sort of map of the animal kingdom, and the, as well as the plants and fungus and Archaea, etc. There's science notes in the back because you know I'm a big science geek. Anyway, that's Grandmother Fish. Um, we self published that in 2015. Uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, the Clades game. We raised money for that one on Kickstarter 2. That was back in 2016. Um, and now it's available through Atlas Games. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking for a long time how do you make a game that gets uh, evolution science right because there's a lot of ways to make a game that gets the science wrong and so uh, that's sort of my answer uh, so there's two versions of that right there's uh, clades which is animals that are alive today and then clades prehistoric with dinosaurs and mammoths and uh, and everybody loves that um, the other evolution project of mine is actually on Kickstarter right now it's something called crow scientist and I'm working with uh, John and Colleen Marsloff they're crow experts here in Seattle. Uh, and we've got a, a free app that's going to help kids learn to observe crows the way a scientist does. So you can find it on Kickstarter right now, Crow Scientist. Um, and that's evolution themed uh, as well. I feel like you have to show kids how animals work and the, um, how the cycles of life work and then they use that information to understand uh, evolution. I'm going to talk about uh, lots of other books too. This is like the the best book for your dollar in terms of like how many uh, drawings of dinosaurs do you get, uh, you know, per dollar. And it's um, available secondhand, super cheap. There's a game called Go Extinct, which teaches 
how to read uh, like the phylogenetic tree, family tree. So that's great. These are from um, actually a lab working on how to uh, teach kids things like this. It's the Child Cognition Lab. Uh, our family tree uh, is a, a favorite of a lot of parents and Stardust is sort of a, a new one, another uh, Kickstarter star. Um, and uh, Bailey Harris, I know she's been at Dragon Con actually as a, as a guest. And uh, I really like this book by Daniel Loxton. If you're um, a skeptic, you might know uh, Loxton's name. He's the editor of Skeptic Junior. And so uh, that, that's a great book. So uh, I'm going to take you through um, the sort of more in-depth one at a time, and we'll talk about, um, you know, as well as uh, some other books. Obviously, there's more than I can get to uh, all in one sitting, but um, we'll get started here with Grandmother Fish. All right, uh, Grandmother Fish was a, a labor of love for a long time. I worked and worked to try to figure out how you could... Um, take a big idea like evolution and make it uh, accessible. You can see here, these are the Kickstarter backers, uh, people who put money up back in 2014 when this was just uh, sketches. And uh, Macmillan was kind enough to keep their names in the end papers. Um, so you can see it's, uh, it's sort of like a folk tale in terms of how it's designed. You know, this is our grandmother fish. She lived a long, 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 long time ago. She could wiggle and swim fast. Can you wiggle? And this is where the uh, kids, even little kids, understand mimicry. I think in some ways that was our first language. And so uh, kids who aren't even speaking yet can interact with the book um, in a way uh, that uh, draws them in. And not only does it draw them in because they're acting, um, but the reason that we can wiggle is because we are descended from fish that wiggled. And the reason that we have jaws to chomp with is that we're descended from fish that have jaws. And so these motions are priming the child to observe their own bodies and behaviors and not take those for granted, but see how those fit into the whole story. So kids wiggle and chomp. Uh, and then we have an interlude where grandmothers Grandmother Fish's uh, grandchildren can all wiggle and chomp. And you can see this is a simplified, but you know, pretty much accurate tree of uh, how these animals split long ago, including our line, which um, this is actually an amniote, but we call her grandmother reptile because kids don't know what an amniote is. And she lived a long, long, long time ago. You see there's only four longs there. Uh, and she can crawl and breathe and you can see that with each grandmother, um, our ancestors are picking up new traits. This is the one that kids love the most because kids love moms and babies and whatever. And so, um, boy, when they see grandmother mammal curling up with her kids, they uh, they really get a kick out of it. And it's, what I'm doing here is helping kids really love the idea that we're animals, that we're part of the animal kingdom, that we're part of this mammal group, that in fact we're apes, we're descended from these apes that lived uh, 20 million years ago, and they can grab and hoot like we can. Um, and then finally we get to uh, the different apes that are alive today, including grandmother human, and she can walk and talk. Uh, and finally we end up with all these grandchildren that can wiggle and chomp and crawl and breathe and squeak and cuddle and grab and hoot and walk and talk. And, and, and this is our uh, story. So you've got to basic story that works for little kids, even kids that aren't talking yet, and then you have more details in the back, uh, like this family tree, where, you know, I don't know if you've ever done an evolutionary tree like this, but every one of these forks has to be in the right spot, right? Like you can't swap the pig and the deer. The pig has to peel off first before the deer and the whale split. And some of these things people aren't sure about, like turtles, where do they go? That's a really big question. Bats are kind of screwy. Um, so this actually represents a lot of information and a lot of uh, scientific work and a lot of help I got from people uh, on the internet. But what this lets a child do is sort of sit down and see who belongs with whom, where, where do things go, where does this fit in, where does that fit in? And thanks to evolution, you can see how everything 
uh, fits together into one uh, one big pattern. And this is something a creationist can never do, is come up with anything as rich and detailed, as informative as a uh, diagram like this. Um, so like I said at the back, um, it's a bunch of uh, science notes, you know, how to explain natural selection to kids, um, if you want to go into more detail on each one of these grandmothers, like who was grandmother ape, right? Like, uh, when did she live? Why did I pick hooting and grabbing as the, the things that sort of uh, define her? And so you can um, even head off a lot of misunderstandings. So one of the things I found in ex explaining evolution to people is it's often what they think they know that is the problem. and. It, um, and so there's just a lot of misinformation. I think that evolution works in ways that the human mind isn't meant to uh, work in. And so, um, for, for instance, in evolution, there's no entity guiding it toward a goal. And entities guiding things towards a goal is kind of how humans think. And so um, what I'm trying to do here is get the kids early and help them understand uh, how things are related so that as they learn more information about more animals or whatever, they have this whole uh, framework of evolution to, to put it into. Um, and, uh, and, and kids love wiggling and hooting and it's great for classes. And uh, so that's always sort of um, central to any time that I'm going to be explaining evolution to kids. I've I've gotten grown-ups uh, wiggling and hooting over it, so that that's also uh, it's also just good fun. I was really lucky to work with um, Karen Lewis. Uh, she's the illustrator on Grandmother Fish. She's uh, local here in Seattle, so I was able to uh, work directly with her, and and um, she helped me with the story, and we went back and forth on art, and we uh, it was a, a great partnership. We work together on another game uh, called Clades. Um, so like I said, there's, uh, Clades is existing animals and Clades Prehistoric is uh, you know, like the two meter long uh, millipede from long ago. For the regular Clades, one of the important things is we put humans in as one of the mammals of the land. Um, and that's uh, an important but uh, subtle little point that uh, I want to sneak into, you know, a kid's education. I want kids uh, in grade school to understand things that Aristotle didn't understand uh, back in the day. Uh, so, Clades is a matching game. You can see part of the fun is simply that you have all these wonderful uh, silhouettes of uh, prehistoric animals and um, uh, existing animals. I love the praying mantis. Uh, for example, I've always been a big praying mantis fan, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, put a bunch of these cards up for you to see and sort of talk about the uh, game. Um, if you know the game set, this uses uh, similar logic. What you're going to try to do is find um, three cards that go together in a pattern, and the pattern is that every, uh, every trait that the card has has to be either shared among all the cards in the triple or it has to be different. So for example, you can have uh, three green cards, you can have three blue cards, you can have a, or you can have a blue, a green, and a red card. But you can't have like two blue and a green. You have to have all three colors or just one color. You have to have three animals on a card or you have to have one and two and three. Or you can have all, just two animals on a card. Uh, so here, here's an example. You take any two um, cards together and there's one other card that will uh, fit with them. Now this is a mix of, uh, you can see prehistoric animals, like this is an uh, ancient cockroach. And you can see existing animals like squirrels. So you can play these games together, you can play them separately. I've mixed the cards up. Um, so you've got a green and a blue, you know the third card's going to have to be red. You've got a three and a two, you know the third card's gonna to have to be a one. You've got air and air, so the third card's gonna to have to also be air. And then you've got mammals and you've got arthropods, so the third one has to be uh, sauropsids. So sauropsids is uh, birds, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, reptiles, that whole uh, family. So opposite side from, uh, from the mammals. So there is no one red air 
uh, sarpsid, and so these two won't go together with a, as a match for what anything that you see out here. Um, there's only one red on the table, so that's uh, often uh, a match. So here's a triple right here. You can see it's all three colors, it's all three environments, um, and it's all three clades. We call them a clade is uh, a branch of a uh, family tree. So this is mammals and sarbsids and arthropods. So this would be a triple and any the kids would all be watching at the same time, trying to be the first one to get a triple. Um, and then the first one would um, take those cards and put them into their own pile. So I think I see a, um, a, another triple that might be easier to see. So this is um, three green arthropods of the land three green sarbsids of the water, and three green mammals of the air. And so that also makes, uh, it's a different kind of match, but it still follows the rules, so that would be another match. So again, you can play these games together, you can play them uh, separately, you can have a lot of kids all playing at once because everyone's watching at the same time. Uh, and they have, just have all this great uh, fun art. And of course, um, if you know me, you already know that there's a bunch of geeky science notes in the game explaining um, sort of the evolution of these animals and, and uh, that sort of thing. So, um, like I said, the other project I have going right now is uh, the Crow Scientist Kickstarter. Um, but I'm here to show you books and things that you can get your hands on. So uh, I'm going to start showing you things from uh, other people besides myself. So. Um, these are a couple of books uh, from the Child Cognition Lab, and they explain um, natural selection. Now, evolution and natural selection go hand in hand, but they're not literally the same thing. So what, what this book teaches is evolution, which is uh, descent, uh, change over time. People knew before Darwin that animals had evolved. What people didn't understand was how, and the how is natural selection. So natural selection is the theory that explains the fact of evolution. While my book explains common descent, this book explains natural selection, which, you know, as, as we all know, is um, you have uh, variation and inheritance uh, and selection pressure over time that produces adaptations. So these are the uh, pelosas um, I believe the anteaters, the great anteaters, their uh, ge uh, genus is the Pelosa genus. So in some ways, these are sort of semi-fictitious animals, but they also kind of represent the ancestors of anteaters. Not aardvarks, they're different. Aardvarks are related to elephants. Uh, anteaters are related to sloths, very different. So what you see is you've got a whole bunch of these pelosas. Um, they've got noses of different lengths. They uh, stick their noses down into um, these burrows and try to eat the ants. Uh, sometimes life is good, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes their noses get all the way in and eat the ants, and sometimes they're too short. And some of the pelosas with the short noses end up dying. So this is, you know, a lot of kids' books don't talk about dying, but that's what natural selection is. This is selection pressure right here. Some survive and have kids, some die off. And that's how the Pelosas got their noses. And so that's a, a cute little story, um, literally designed by scientists to help kids understand uh, natural selection. And then you see something they're seeing here. It's another story about um, hardship and um, who can get the food and who can't and how things change over time. So uh, those are two great books, and you can be guaranteed that that uh, science is right. So here's another book I like a whole lot. Um, it's, uh, it isn't about evolution per se, but it is a, uh, well, that's a lie. Um, it, it's about uh, page after page of beautiful color spreads uh, replicating uh, all the animals that, um, and plants that have come for us. It's just this amazing uh, timeline and um, you get to see uh, all these images um, 
there's keys for all the weird animals and plants that you see, and it just goes on and on and on. And so um, you you see what the earlier forms were, these, you know, weird eel-like things with teeth uh, that were all the rage for a while, the great sea scorpions. And um, now the, the great thing about this book is uh, you can get it online for $10, including postage. I don't know if it got overprinted or what the issue is, but uh, secondhand, you can get it super cheap. And you can see it is a big, chip, thick, chunky book. Um, you can see in the back here, this is uh, all the different uh, two-page spreads side by side, so you can see everything at once. Uh, the detail is just amazing. Like There's so many different uh, animals that I've never seen before. Um, and uh, it just goes on and on. It uh, has a bunch of special points that, like, here is the big dying, the big extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, and you can see sort of what made through and what didn't. Um, but what I'm just impressed with is you, you just go page after page of uh, color art filled with um, all sorts of critters early mammals, uh, creatures of the water, um, and these are all based on uh, specific fossil beds where um, scientists have been able to cre recreate sort of what, what life looked like there. And again, for under 10 bucks, uh, it's just amazing. Um, I honestly have bought several of them uh, to, uh, to give away because of that price, you know, why not? One of, the, one of the reasons I like this book, I've got to say, is that it really drives home how, uh, how extinction is the rule rather than the exception. Because you just look at page after page after page of extinct animals. All, you know, all these dinosaurs, all these pterosaurs, they all, uh, eventually their lineages went extinct with no uh, survivors, right? The, these animals too, uh, these pterosaurs, they went extinct. Um, maybe some of those fish are, have uh, descendants today, but probably not. Uh, early birds extinct, um, early mammals. Uh, so, some of these species gave rise to lineages that survived today before the species itself went extinct. But honestly, most species on Earth um, have died out. And you just see that, wow, you just, the Earth has been around for so long. There's been so many um, uh, different eras and so many ecosystems and so many climates. Uh, just a huge variety of animals uh, over time and then uh, just extinct, extinct, extinct. Um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I find it humbling to look back over just how expansive um, the past was and how many animals there were. And um, I, I, I feel like I loved dinosaurs when I was growing up, but I had a pretty limited uh, appreciation for um, what animals were around and, and how long they've been around and what, the, what varieties they were and, and so forth. So these are like uh, the Scutosauruses. They're part of a whole line of uh, reptiles or near reptiles that uh, went entirely extinct. And I think these are Garganopsians. And so these are the, they were the top predators and they were related to us. They were on our side of the, uh, of the amniote family and they all went extinct um just you know dead 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 and this one um to its credit it goes back really early so um you see some things at the beginning like really uh primitive plants and sort of the first little bugs that would eat the first little uh land plants trilobites always loved them um and uh you know i i have used this uh not just for fun, but also for um, looking up things, looking up what's related to who, by how much, um, w when different things evolved. Uh, these are animals, uh, believe it or not. They don't look like um, 
animals look today. Uh, but like I said, the book goes way back into the past, and that's uh, a, a delight. Um, you know, here's some microscopic uh, fossils. Uh, in the back, and it's got a, a big timeline. You know, you can see what, what the continents of the Earth look like at different times. Here's a guide to all sorts of different species that are alive today. I mean, it's just a trove of information. Um, I mean, and you can see, well, at 10 bucks, right? Who doesn't want uh, one of these um, for their coffee table for 10 bucks? So I also want to talk about uh, Go Extinct. Um, so it's really easy to do a bad game uh, on evolution. Uh, games are about making choices, and evolution happens without anybody making choices. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a hard thing to do. So this is Go Extinct. It was um, written by a, a graduate student and a game fan, game designer. And um, I love phylogenetic trees like this. Um, there's so much information in terms of which creatures are more closely related to which ones and so forth. And so this clever game is a variation on uh, Go Fish. And the variation is that um, when you are asking for matches, you uh, can decide how specific or how general you want to be. So if you, for instance, the Northsiders, that's the Laurasians. Sorry, Laurasiatherians. Those are the animals that evolved on the northern continent of Laurasia. And that's like most of the land animals we think of. So carnivores and, uh, you know, the, all the ungulates, all the um, even toad ungulates, odd toad ungulates, even though I don't necessarily use those terminology anymore, but all those land animals are the north siders. So you could ask for, do you have any north siders? And that would be lions, bats, horses, or whales. But you could also say, do you have any warm fuzzies? And that's any mammal. So that includes platypuses, elephants. And now, um, depending on how broad you ask, you're more likely to get a card, but less likely to get the very card that you want. And uh, Ariel Marcy, the inventor of this game, she even took the trouble of coming up with a cute name for each clade of animals. So, for instance, scientists call these Laurasiatherians, uh, and she calls them the Northsiders because they lived in the north, right? And then uh, these are animals are called the placentals. That's most mammals are placentals. Uh, she calls them the big babies because placental mammals give birth to large babies, whereas the marsupials give birth to larval babies that really don't develop until after uh, they've had a lot of milk. And of course, the monotremes, or the fur scrambles, she calls them, uh, they lay eggs are also tiny. And so our ability to um, carry babies to term, to, to, to be much larger before they're born, is sort of a, a in, indicative to us. So we're the big babies. Um, I, I just get a real kick out of that. You know, I've tried really hard to figure out how to explain things to kids. And um, uh, I think terminology like that is, uh, is really useful. So uh, here's another game by um, somebody who loves games and kids and teaching kids uh, evolution. There are even um, a couple of other versions of it. Um, it all works based on uh, an evolutionary tree and you can zero in on evolutionary trees just about anywhere in our um, uh, in, in the big in the big picture. You can zero in really close, or you can zoom out. And um... so, Stardust is another uh, book. This was a really cute one. It's very uh, kid oriented. Um, so it's written by Bailey and her father uh, Douglas Harris, and. Um, you know, it's a cute uh, introduction with um, uh, kind of nice artsy art that um, places us, you know, in the solar system as part of the uh, family of living things. And you can see sort of uh, over the eras, uh, different animals evolved, and now they're um, no no unicorns. That was a uh, false start. Uh, and finally, there were uh, humanoids and us. Uh, all from uh, Stardust. So that's a, 
Uh, that is a cute one. Uh, this is our family tree. So um, when I was working on Grandmother Fish, I wanted to see what other books there were out there about uh, evolution. And this one is about the closest to Grandmother Fish in that um, it's very much a story and uh, it aims young. It's not as young as Grandmother Fish um, and it doesn't have the interactive activities to draw in the really little kids, um, but it's a big favorite. Um, I, I, I had parents read it and they liked it and I often would ask parents about it, about what books they recommended and they would uh, often recommend this one. This one goes Grandmother Fish, you know, it starts with an animal that actually already has a face so that kids can kind of fall in love with it. But this one starts, you know, really early with DNA and individual cells. And um, But you can see that, you know, these are uh, real prehistoric animals that someone has um, taken care to, uh, to get accurately. And um, so it's about uh, sort of our story over time. Um, and uh, it covers sort of not only our own lineage, but uh, the other creatures that were uh, evolving at the same time, so dinosaurs and um, elephasaurs. And, and so then we get into the mammals, and of course everyone loves the mammals, and it's almost like another version of Grandmother Eve. So, uh, so this is another good one that's just sort of... Um, uh, beloved and uh, heartwarming. Um, I really like, uh, let's see, Daniel Loxton's book, um, Evolution. So, I, I, he, he's really lucky, Daniel Loxton, because he's capable of doing kind of his own art and graphic design, and boy, that has got to make things easier. And you can see this is just filled with uh, great imagery, evolution, how we and all living things came to be. Daniel Loxton is the editor of Junior Skeptic. Um, so he took a whole bunch of the things that he has said over time about evolution. Um, so this is about the age of the earth, or it's about fossils, or variation and reproduction. You know, it's sort of um, one bit at a time. And you can see it's broken up into little... Uh, segments that are each uh, kind of digestible. Um, everything is illustrated and uh, uh, really, uh, really just uh, lovely. The illustrations um, really uh, bring things home. He's got a great one here where he says, hey, instead of thinking of us as being like in a line, really we're on this branch and tree going in different directions. And um, boy, that's something that I want kids to know early. Right, because uh, misinformation will really mess you up. So there's questions about like, uh, you know, how did the eye evolve? Or all the things that you hear from creationists or people that doubt um, uh, evolution. So, you know, not only has it got a bunch of good information about evolution itself, it also has a bunch of sort of counter information against the misinformation that you might see. So that's a lot of fun. So if you like collecting uh, older books, you can often find some uh, interesting items. So here's a book, uh, it's beautifully illustrated. Um, it's got all these um, ancient animals, ancient primates, uh, these sort of evocative drawings uh, of different animals that came before us. There's sort of um, the lineage that led to our line and uh, humanity. And uh, I love these illustrations. Uh, the title is 70 Million Years of Man. And why 70 million years? Well, scientists used to think that humans were off on their own line, separate from the apes. Like, we're not gorillas, we're not monkeys. And they sort of imagined that humans had been evolving from early primates for 70 million years. Well, it turns out it's more like 7 million years. We're, we're more closely related to chimps and bonobos than gorillas are. And uh, this would, today, this would be like 5 million years of man, or I guess it would be 
five million years of humans today. <clears throat> it's another way that book is outdated. Uh, but it's sometimes fun to see what the old books have in store for us. I like this one, first book of the earth. This is like from the 40s. So uh, this is really old stuff. It's interesting to see what people were trying to uh, teach kids when, I don't know, I want to say science was still kind of young. Uh, so here's my favorite example out of this book. You can see, oh, here's some animals of the water. You know, this is a typical evolution book talking about animals in the water. And then you get to uh, these creatures. They're called the queer animals who lived in the sea. So uh, that's lovely. Um, and you can see there's a pterosaur and uh, the mosasaur is a giant lizard. And look, there's a bird, uh, right? A swimming bird. Well, why in the world would this book put these animals that uh, evolved from the first reptilian kind of animals, why would they put that before the first reptiles? Look, the first reptiles don't appear for uh, pages yet. Well, if you look in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it says that the creatures of the air and the water, like the Pteranodon and the Mosasaur, were created before the creatures of the land. And is that why this book has the creatures of the water before the land animals that uh, they descended from? Yeah, hard to say. So I love, uh, I love cute little books like that and um, uh, seeing what they have in store. <clears throat> this one I, I'm especially fond of. So uh, this is a pretty old book for books that uh, teach evolution and the uh, exciting thing about it for me um, is that it was written by the woman who ended up writing Magic School Bus. Now, here's where you can find more about activities uh, to do with kids about evolution. This is the Grandmother Fish website on the activities page. Got a lot of resources here. Some of these will look familiar. There's a rep webinar on how educators can use Grandmother Fish and clades in the classroom. Uh, one of the resources we provide on the website are these images of the grandmothers, and you can see they have the scientific name, Nathos Domes, and the actual time, how long ago these things lived, how many hundreds of millions of years. And uh, these are all full-size images that you can uh, print out and use in a classroom or as some sort of kids' activity. I've also calculated how long it would take to say each grandmother's name with all the greats in the name, like great grandmother fish. Those literally were a fish that lived 200 million generations ago. So those are our grandparents uh, with 200 million greats. Great, 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 great. It would take you three years to say great grandmother fish's whole name. You can see the same thing with reptile and mammal. When you get to ape or human, wow, you can say their name in an hour or a week. It's a uh, big difference. Gives sense, a sense for kids for what deep time is like. There's also a timeline here. You can um, have kids line up on a timeline to represent where grandmother fish and grandmother mammal were on this timeline relative to other things like when the dinosaurs lived, say, or when various extinctions happened. Then I like to um, shrink that timeline down. They start with a timeline from the first jawed fish to us, and then they change the timeline to be from the start of life to us, or from the start of Earth to us, or from the start of the universe to us. And they see just how small a fraction of the universe's life is uh, life on Earth. Then um, here are some science questions. Uh, you can, of course, think of your own, but these look at each of the grandmothers and grandmother fish and give you something to talk about with kids about uh, what those actions mean or what those animals were. Or a little more fun, here's the Charles Darwin dance. We all know the hokey pokey. Uh, so this is the Charles Darwin dance. Uh, you kind of dance and sing to the same tune. Uh, the big word you're teaching here, kids, is derive. You derive uh, an arm out of a fin. And so uh, this is a goofy song where um, you start out with uh, 
fins that you put into the middle one at a time and you, you derive from them arms and legs and uh, so forth. Uh, finally, here's a, just a page that sort of summarizes a lot of what you have already seen here. You'll see in that photograph, there's a lot of the same things that we've already seen. Um, and here's where I talk about the books that you've just seen and you can look up uh, what age they're for and who the authors are. And there's a couple of things on here that, um, that the Great Ad Adaptations book is out of print. So I didn't show uh, a copy of that, but there's also some websites that are great and uh, just some uh, guidelines for explaining natural selection to kids. So uh, you could look around on this uh, website and see what sorts of inspiration you might get for uh, the kinds of activities you do with kids. Thanks very much. Cool. Well, you know, it's funny because I've had you on my podcast, Skepticality, um, okay. and we talked mainly about grandmother fish. So it's fun to see the new stuff you're working on. Um, so ever since, because when I had you on the show, the book had just come out. Okay. So, and I've seen your presentation now. So how have kids been reacting to all the stuff you've been doing? Yeah, so uh, great question. I've gotten a lot of really interesting email from uh, parents who uh, talk about the um, how much their kids are affected by the book. Uh, because kids love to know where things go and know how things relate and know how things fit. And so when kids learn that they fit into the animal kingdom as part of it, they, they get really excited. There was one kid who would um, talk to strangers in the supermarket and she would say, I am a human. You know, she was just sort of so excited to find out like, that's a dog, that's a cat. I'm a human. This is right. And it sort of blew her mind. <laughs> we, caught, we caught on video a six-year-old where the light bulb actually went off where she realized she's reading the, her mom's reading her the book and she realizes that this story about the fish and the reptile and the mammal and the ape it's really about her because the fifth grandmother in the series is grandmother human and then she sees that the light bulb goes off. She can hardly form a question. She's trying to ask her mom about it because she's so flabbergasted to realize well, the clincher on this story is that it's it's our story. Um, it also has uh, an appeal to really little kids because it's like you, you know it's motions like hooting and and wiggling and and kids love that. Even uh, kids with autism uh, can respond to it, uh, even if they're not verbal. A lot of them will enjoy sort of uh, acting along, um, and so. There was one little kid who it was like the first book he ever asked for. His parents would read him the, uh, the book when he was little, pre-verbal. And then when he first started to make words, that was the book that he wanted, uh, that he remembered people, uh, his parents reading to him. And so um, another little kid, you know, first read it when he was really little, really liked it. Now he's older. Now he can look at the material in the back and start to learn more about sort of what is the science behind the story that he's been hearing for years. So, so we did the book on Kickstarter because we knew parents would be really excited about the idea, but it wasn't really until the book was done and in kids' hands that we realized um, sort of how strongly they, they respond to it. I think it's because it's a, it's a personal story. It's about, uh, it's about them and it's about animals and the, the, the whole world of life. It's kind of funny because uh, last year at DragonCon, we had Bailey Harris, who wrote yeah. the book Stardust, and she had a similar story, but from the kids' perspective that you just talked about, where she got so excited, she wanted to write a book. <laughs> and she did, and now she has a, a few of them. And now she has a game coming out as well. Yeah. Uh, so what is okay. it with uh, people that do books about science communication for kids who also make games? Also, your game, has the game been recept re received by the kids? Yeah, so uh, we got a, um, got a, lot of, a lot of good feedback on Clades and Clades Prehistoric. Um, those are uh, it's for slightly older kids because it's a, a logic game. Um, but kids love the drawings and um, they love figuring things out. And so the puzzle of trying to figure out which uh, cards go together is great. And then we got good feedback from a middle school teacher who said, 
that the game really encourages kids to ask questions um, kind of from a deeper perspective or from with more insight than uh, than he's used to because kids actually sort of put their knowledge of the relationships among animals, their evolutionary descent, put that knowledge into use while they're uh, while they're playing the game. And so you sort of can't help but uh, learn something from it. So that, that's been uh, really good. It's, it's kind of funny because I've always said that it's easier for kids to accept evolution than adults that haven't been exposed to it before. Because I think kids go, it's pretty obvious I'm related to a, you know, monkeys yeah. and apes. I mean, they look like me. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. And a lot of the a lot of the challenge is on the emotional level, right? Yeah. Like there are people who, you know, object to the idea that we're descended from apes or other animals, and um, you know, find that sort of impure or like it's a it's a transgressive idea. So you know, grandmother fish makes it uh, attractive and fun and exciting to be an animal and to be related to animals. And so, um, you know, I, I think getting to kids at that level and showing them how to appreciate the marvel of evolution and being part of the natural world. And then the great thing about it, you know, is that it is a story for all of us. Most, you know, most origin stories like the Adam and Eve story are for the small group of people who believe that story. And the story of evolution is for everybody. So now the book is in Italian, it's in Chinese, it's in Japanese, um, because it's a it's a universal story. I always find it fun talking to authors. Like I would find it really interesting to pick up a book that's your book and you can't read it in all the different languages. <laughs> you don't know. Maybe it's not telling you the same story. <laughs> it's not the same story. That's right. So how has, have you had any backlash at all? So, yeah, so I, you know, I'm very public because we raise money on Kickstarter. So, you know, Grandmother Fish has uh, her own Twitter and uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, so we're, we're out there and, you know, Ken Ham doesn't like the book. You might not. <sighs> what does he that. like? Yeah, exactly. So, right, he's the answers in Genesis guy. Um, so they don't like the book. Every once in a while, I get somebody, you know, who says I'm doing a horrible, evil thing by uh, teaching kids uh, Satan's lies or something like that. Cool. And uh, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and my tactic generally is to appeal to the Constitution because these people tend to be like patriotic Americans. And so I say, yeah. well, I support your First Amendment right to teach kids what you believe so i expect you as a good american will support my first amendment right and you know they don't have a lot to say to that because that's sort of crossing the streams for them right is, yeah. is if you pull the constitution card it's hard for uh you know a rah rah patriotic american to say no to that yeah that's kind of you know bailey harris was on my track last year and i had i did a one-on-one talk with her and her parents were there and they talked about how much backlash she got in high school or no, she wasn't in high school even in school yeah. because yeah. teachers didn't mind but parents yeah. would find out and yeah. the kids like you're you're evil and like it's a kid right you're like wow parents teaching yeah. the other kid to like be mean to another kid because yeah. they wanted to like teach you something yeah so yeah. it was i was curious to see if you have had some of that same backlash she sadly was in uh Salt Lake, Utah. So, yeah. you know, oh, okay. Well, so she was already, you know, in the middle of it. So, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. The, so the Mormons haven't officially declared whether uh, evolution is real or young Earth creationism. You know, I think they know that some Mormons know that the Earth is old, and some think that it's young, and and uh, they don't want to cause a schism or problem by coming down one way or the other. So it's like they're, they're kind of... Well, I've already done them that many times, so... Yeah. Not that they all the religions have, so... <laughs> well, very cool. Well, where can people find you and all your stuff, or your Twitter, your website? Yeah, sure. So Grandmother Fish is... Um, she's easy to find on Facebook and Twitter and uh, Instagram. And uh, that's a great way to uh, keep up with everything we're doing, like the, the Crow Scientist app. Uh, that's on Kickstarter right now, for example. 
Um, and, you know, our stuff is available uh, just about anywhere. Macmillan um, picked up our Grandmother Fish book and released a new version back in 2016. You know, we had a self-published version that sold out. And so Macmillan, you know, puts Grandmother Fish everywhere. So it's online and it's in the big uh, chain bookstores. How many of those are left? How many chain bookstores are left? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good. That is a good question. I I hope that people can support their friendly local bookstores and uh, uh, and and try to get it from there rather than online. But however you want to get it. Yeah, very cool. Well, like I said, hopefully I will see you in person. Wouldn't that be hopefully. nice? Yeah, I know. Wouldn't it? Um, yeah. But thank you so much for taking some time and coming on our virtual Dragon Gun. Yeah, thanks, Derek. It's been great. As fun as all this streaming content is, we sincerely cannot wait to see you all in person again next year. Remember to stay healthy and safe until then. Wear a mask when interacting with other people out in the real world. Want more Skip Track? Get more than 10 years of Skeptics Track programming at our video archive video.skeptrack.org